Hello everyone and welcome to our very first uh, Breathe Belief webinar. I am so excited to have you guys all here with me and I am just excited to start doing these webinars on a regular basis. So um, welcome and today what we're going to be talking about is nurturing the love of learning in our children. And so this was a question that came up on our Breathe Belief community Facebook page. Someone, you know, just asked, what do you do to nurture the love of learning in your children? And I feel like this is so important. And I thought, why not make this our very first webinar topic? So what I did is I came up with eight different steps to help us to nurture this just natural love of learning in our children. Because I feel that children are just born learning. They are hardwired to learn. They do that from the very moment they come out. They're looking around and they're figuring stuff out and they're just learning all the time. But unfortunately, often when they start to go to school and the older they get and the more school they get, they just start to dislike learning. And they're still learning, but they just start to hate it. And often it's that they don't like school, but sometimes they still really do like learning, just not in that kind of environment and not the way that school wants them to learn. And so what we wanna do is to nurture that intrinsic love of learning in our children. And so what we're going to do is I created a slideshow presentation for you guys. So I'm gonna screen share here in a minute and go through these different steps that um, help us to nurture a love of learning in our children. And then at the very end, I'll put the camera back on me and I can answer any questions you guys might have over in the chat box. And if there aren't any today, then I will just say adios and we'll see you guys in the next webinar. So if you give me just one minute here, I'm gonna do the screen share. All right, I hope you guys can all see this right here. So, nurturing a love of learning in your young child. And this is, again, our Breathe Belief community webinar. And again, welcome. So glad you're here participating with us. This is gonna be super exciting. So, what I wanna do is introduce myself a little bit because I realized that this is <clears throat> excuse me, a brand new community. And all of you may not know that much about me yet. And so I want to introduce myself and give you a little bit of an idea of who I am and where I'm coming from. So this is a picture of my husband and I. We got married pretty young and this is at our wedding day. Um, and you know, at this point, I didn't have homeschooling on the brain at all. I knew I wanted to have children and I figured I would, you know, I'd get a career, my kids would go off to daycare and then they'd go off to school. And then as they got older, they'd be into sports and activities. And I'd see them, you know, at night after we did our homework and on the weekends, you know, after our weekend activities. And I figured that's what my life was going to be like. It really never occurred to me that there was another way of being educated um, aside from the conventional um, school model, particularly the public school model. And my understanding was that private schools were heavily modeled after public schools. And so, you know, I had a very limited view on education and homeschooling was not something I wanted to do. Um, shortly after we got married, a relative of my husband said she was thinking about homeschooling. And my first thought was, that's weird. <laughs> Why would you ever want to do that? And she started telling me about it and I just became so intrigued. And it just sparked this fire in me that I never knew existed. And this curiosity that was just enormous about education. And at the time, I hadn't yet declared my major. And I ended up um, majoring, my undergraduate degree was in family and education, because I knew that's what I wanted to do. The more I learned about home education, the more I knew that that was right for our family. And I just dug into it. And lo and behold, my husband had been planning, wanting to homeschool our children the whole time. So he was right on board um, before I was. And we, 
you know, I just started learning. And ever since then, I've been studying principles of great education and business and how we can help our children to be successful and to learn. Um, and so not too long after we got married, and I was still in college, we had our first daughter here, and she's almost seven years old now. And then we had another beautiful little girl who's two, and I have um, an almost six-month-old baby as well. And so I am just the proud mother of three little princesses, and I have just expanded my vision of what education is and I've come to believe that it can be something very joyful and that can happen naturally and that you don't have to follow the conventional school model to achieve a great education. And so one of my missions in life now is to share this with other people so that they can open up this new world of education for their children as well. So what I've done with that is I've created the Breathely community and it's all about empowering parents and breathing belief into them that they can educate their children at home and offering them support and encouragement and education along the way. And so a little bit about us. So we believe that meaningful education can happen naturally. You don't need textbooks, grades, levels, and testing and compulsion. That, that isn't absolutely needed to have a great education. We believe that education can be joyful. We believe that we are the experts of our own family. You know, no one knows your family like you do. I don't know your family like you do. Some best-selling author or government official, they don't know your children like you do. And you are the expert. And so we believe in learning and studying. You know, that's why we have these webinars, so that we continue to learn. But then we go back and we prayerfully and we think and we decide what's best for our family at this point in time. And you know, we respect the educational decisions of others. This isn't for everyone and that's okay. And we respect their decisions and we just want people to respect our own. And we strive to be people of excellence. So that's a little bit about this community that I hope you have joined us now and that you can be a part of our community because really the more we have and the more engagement we have, the better we're going to be able to accomplish these missions. And so what we do is we offer um, a community, you know, we want to create friendships and support with like-minded people who share these ideals of education. Um, we have an online book club where we pick a book each month and we study it about education and we learn from each other and share our insights and have a live discussion. And we keep learning through webinars like we're doing here and have a yearly retreat where we can get together and you know participate in workshops and learn together and really just connect on a deeper basis. So that's a little bit about myself and about the Breathe Believe community. Now I want to share with you the eight steps of nurturing a love of learning in our children. So when I think about nurturing a love of learning in our children, I think about this quote and it's by William Butler Yeats. It's that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And I absolutely love this quote. And truly, it has become like the backbone of everything I do when educating my children. I think about, am I just filling a pail right now, or am I lighting a fire? When I think about a pail, you know, I just think of, you know, someone just you know, slushing water into a pail, filling a water into a pail, and it, water's just slushing around. And if you try to, you know, use a fire hose, so much of that water is just going to fall out of the pail, right? And if we try to just force all this knowledge on our children, so much of it's just going to fall back out. And it's not self-sustaining. It constantly needs someone else to feed it. But if you think of it like a fire, that our children are, is this, you know, logs. They're this kindling just waiting for a spark, right? That they have all this in them. They just need a spark that will ignite this fire that will be self-sustaining. That we don't have to keep 
forcing information on our children, but that they are going to yearn to learn, that they're going to go after it themselves because they are naturally hardwired to learn. And so we just want to light that fire so that they can become, you know, these independent, these self-motivated learners throughout their lives. And so when I think about what I'm doing, I like to think, you know, am I lighting a fire right now or am I just trying to fill this bucket? Because what we want to do is light that fire within our children so that they can go forward in life with passion and excitement, right? So I want to share with you these eight steps that I think are going to help us to light that fire and just nurture this natural love of learning in our children. So step one is modeling. Now, I love this picture. You can see this mom here with this little boy, and the mom's reading at one end, the little boy's reading at the other. And to me, it's such a great example of modeling. And modeling is just doing ourselves what we want our children to do. So if we want our children to be avid readers, we need to be avid readers. We just need to set the example. And that is so important because children learn so much by observing us. And if you're a home educator, your children are going to learn so much from you because you are going to be their primary example. Instead of them being at school with strangers every day, um, they're at home with you and learning from you. And, you know, it's more about what is caught than what is taught. So if they catch you learning, that's going to be a lot more powerful than you just preaching to them about learning. So we want to show that we're studying, you know, let them see you study, let them see you read, you know, tell them about what you're working on. So if you are you know, working on something, and maybe this is something you do at night while they're sleeping because it's kind of hard for you to do during the day with them. Just talk to them about it. Be like, hey, do you, let me tell you about what I learned. I'm so excited. Let me tell you about what I was learning yesterday. And show them just genuine enthusiasm about what you're learning, that you love to learn, and that you feel like learning is something that you're going to do throughout your life. Um, and so recently, I was wanting to um, inspire my daughter to write, to read more. And we've been reading, and I wanted her just to do something else to inspire her to read. And so one day, I did something really simple, and I found a dry erase marker. And I just wrote her a little, a little note on our bathroom mirror. And she saw her name, you know, she recognized her name, and then she saw, oh, this is for me, and she started reading it, and it was so exciting, and so then what she did is she grabbed the dry erase marker, and then she wrote a message back to me, and then my husband wrote a message to her, and now she's writing messages to her um, younger sister, and they're just kind of these little love notes, like, I love you, I love your smile, I'm so grateful you're my daughter, just these little things, and what I realized was she, she did what she saw me do. I didn't have to tell her, you know, all right, we're going to sit down and you need to write a note to someone and it needs to be nice. Here, here's a pen and paper. Go do it. No, it was something fun and I just had to model it and then she did it back. And now all of a sudden, you know, almost every day we're writing a new little message and we're reading and writing and it's just fun way to do it. And it came from just modeling the behavior that I wanted to see in my daughter. So, you know, do that and think about the things you say. You know, do, do your children hear you say that you love learning, that you love reading, and that you love studying? Um, so the key here is just to model the behavior that you would like to see. Step two is to invite and not force. So I like this picture because to me, this is just inviting. The mom's like, hey, look at this, you know, like inviting the child. Would you like to learn how to garden with me? And all the other things that go into gardening, all of the science about nature and plants and the cycles, life cycles, like so much learning can happen. And it wasn't a, all right, now we're to this point in our curriculum or textbook and these are... The different parts of the tree you need to label them you know and you 
you need to do this right now. You know, that, and most people aren't going to find that a lot of fun and are going to be really excited about it. But when you invite them to learn with you, that is so much better. Because what I found is children really love to be with their parents, especially young children. Young children feel so much love when their parents want to spend time with them. So I encourage you to invite your child to learn with you. Now this can be a little tougher because it's a lot easier to hand them a workbook and to tell them what to do than it is to take upon yourself additional learning and being patient with your child as they learn along with you. And you know, in our family, something that we want to do is we want to learn Spanish as a family. My husband speaks great Spanish. I speak so, so Spanish. And my daughters understand a little bit. They know a little bit. But I, I want our children to learn Spanish, and I want to learn. And so I invited my daughter. I said, would you like to learn Spanish with me? Yes, she would like to learn Spanish with me. She wants to do stuff with me. And so we do it together. You know, we might sign on to Duolingo, their free Spanish learning software online, and we learn and participate together. And it just makes it so much more fun. And so when you can invite and not force, you're going to get a lot better feedback and your children will be a lot more excited and to love learning a lot more. Because children as well, they, they love freedom. And it's just a human nature that we want to have freedom. We, um, it's human nature to rebel when someone tries to force us to do something. So if you can inspire or invite your children to do something without force, you're going to really nurture that love of learning a lot more. All right, step number three is creating a learning environment. Um, so this is just all about thinking about the space that you have, your home. You know, do you have educational things around? Um, I look at this picture and, you know, they've got a little microscope, they've got a stethoscope, they have writing utensils, they have paper, they have pens, they have, it looks like some books in the back. You know, do you have toys that are open-ended, toys that encourage curiosity, um, toys that encourage imagination and role-playing? Do they have materials to write and to draw, to create, to build? Do you have um, books readily available? Are the books way up high where your kids can't even get them? Or are they down low where they can reach them and pick them up whenever they feel like it? You know, do you have an a inviting place for your kids to sit and look at a book? So all of these things can really help nurture that love of learning because they're going to see these things around them. And if you can make them easily accessible, it's going to really help their desire and their love of learning. And so um, I was thinking about one example from my own life is recently um, we sat down with my daughter and we're like, you know, what are some things that you want to learn about this week? Because we talk about that. What are some things she wants to learn and work on this week? And out of the blue, she's like, I want to learn all the names of the countries and the places that they are because I don't know that yet. And I was like, okay, I was so excited. And I, I really feel like a big part of why she wanted to learn that is because we have a map. We have a huge world map that we go to often. When we read a book, when we learn about um, current events in around the world, we go to the map and we go, oh, look, it, that's where this is. That's right there. And we talk about, you know, places maybe um, – my husband and I have been before places we want to go to and we go to that map often and it's in a place and it's down low where she can see the entire map you know and I feel like having that in our environment has really encouraged her to want to learn about geography and that was something all on her own nothing I had to force but this love of learning just came out of her she wants to learn about it she wants to know about these materials and things that we have in our home so when you can create an environment that invites learning that is going to help a great deal 
And this is really something great to think about um, as the holidays are coming up right now. You know, think about the kinds of gifts that you want to give. Try to get gifts that encourage, you know, curiosity in our children. All right, so the next thing um, is to be aware of your language. Um, one thing that we do in our family um, are affirmations. We try to, every day, we, in, we stand up in the bathroom as a family, and we all look in the mirror, and we say certain things to ourselves. And this has been so powerful for our family. And I first started doing this when my daughter was um, about two years old, my first daughter, and she was very shy. If you look at her now, you would never think that. But when she was two, she was very shy. And I, I didn't want her to be shy because I felt like she would miss out on a lot of great, you know, meaningful relationships and opportunities if she continued to hide behind my legs whenever we went somewhere new. And so I just started giving her an affirmation. And the affirmation was, I would tell her, Rebecca, you are friendly and outgoing. You are friendly and outgoing. You are friendly and outgoing. When she would start to be really shy. And at the time, that's not who she was. But I was seeing her as who should she could become. And she saw me as someone she could trust. And so she started to take on that persona that she was friendly and outgoing. If you meet her now, she's extremely friendly and outgoing. And what really hit home was one day, um, I was meeting with a woman in our church, and out of the blue, she just goes, oh, your daughter is just so friendly and outgoing. And she used the exact same words that we had been telling her over and over. And we had never said that in front of this woman before, but my daughter had just come to embody this affirmation that we had been telling her and that she had begun to tell herself. Another time we were uh, at the park and she was nervous. She was on this ball thing that was rolling. It was really fast and it was really hard. And she started saying an affirmation to herself that we had been saying in front of the mirror every day. She said, you know, mom, I, I'm strong and I face my fears. I push through the pain and discomfort. I am brave and I face my fears. That's what it was. I was, I'm brave and I face my fears. And oh, it just warmed my heart because we had put in this, these default thoughts into her head. So before when something got hard and was scary, she might think this is hard and scary. I want to stop. Instead, she remembered these things that we had told her that she had told herself that I am brave and I face my fears and she kept going. And so one affirmation that we have to encourage a love of learning is one of ours is that I love reading and learning new things. And so every day we tell ourselves, I love reading and learning new things. And right now I can tell you my daughter loves reading and learning new things. And that's something we continue to do day after day. Now another thing um, about language is to think about how you are responding to questions and suggestions from your children. So, you know, think about if they ask you a question, do you brush it off right away? Are you just like, I don't know, and you just forget about it? Or do you encourage it? You know, some great responses would be, that's a great question. Let's find out together. You know, or I'm so glad you're thinking about these things. What do you think? I'm so glad you asked. I think it's great that you want to learn about this. These are some great responses to their questions that are going to encourage them to want to continue to ask questions because the more that they ask, the more they're going to learn and the more their curiosity and their love of learning is going to grow. Another thing to be aware of with our language is the kind of praise that we give our children. Um, if you guys are familiar with Carol Dweck, she talks a lot about this growth mindset and how the praise that we give our children can really affect them. So in essence, I've created this little chart here. So instead of saying things like, wow, you did a great job, which, you know, seems like a perfectly nice thing to say, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily bad. Instead, what you can say is, wow, I can tell you put a lot of effort into that. 
So you go from praising the outcome to praising their effort. All right, let's look at another example. If you said, see, reading is easy, you could try instead saying, you've been practicing and it shows. Instead of just saying, you did it, you could say, that was a really tough part of the book, but you pushed through it and didn't quit. I am so proud of you. Do you see how we go from praising their outcome to praising their efforts? Because um, what Carol Dweck found is that um, when you start telling kids all the time that, you know, you're smart and this is really easy for you, which is a great, you know, very nice thing to say. But when you say that, they start internalizing that, that they're smart, which is a good thing. But then if they get into a situation where they're being challenged, they can become afraid that they will no longer be seen as smart. And they don't want to let people down and they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want people to not think that they're smart. And they're not thinking about their effort, but they're thinking about being smart. And so instead of taking on a new challenge and working hard to learn something new, they shut down and they'll stop trying. Because if they don't even try, then it's not that they're not smart. They just didn't even try. They don't care, right? But when we praise their efforts and they come to a challenge, what she found through her research and doing this with children was that when they're efforts were praised, they were working harder. They were pushing themselves and in essence learning so much more because they saw their hard work as being very valued and so they would work harder. And so it's so important to think about how we praise our children and to really encourage their efforts um, because, you know, things are not always going to be easy and they need to know that a lot of effort is needed to learn and to become these great men and women that we want them to become. Um, so if you guys want to learn more about that, I really encourage you to um, study more about the growth mindset and research by Carol Dweck. And if you want, you can email me and I can um, give you some resources about that as well. All right, next is we want to make learning engaging. So, you know, make sure they're involved in the learning. We don't just want to preach to them all the time, but make sure that they're involved um, and actively learning, that they're participating. Make sure they're using their senses, that they're touching and feeling and seeing and hearing and that they're not just, you know, doing a workbook. That's not very engaging. But instead of doing a workbook about, um, the season's changing. Instead, get outside and touch and feel and learn and talk about it. Let them ask questions. Make it a discussion, right? Um, I was listening to some works by Oliver DeMille, and he talked about being a glaze killer, which I thought was just a great phrase, be a glaze killer. You know, if you go to schools, um, often if you go to a kindergarten classroom, um, kids are super excited and there's not a lot of glaze on their face because school is this novel thing. It's brand new and they're a big kid now and it's so much fun, right? Teachers do a lot of things to make it hands-on and engaging. But as they get older, school loses its novelty. They begin to realize they don't have very much freedom anymore and it becomes less engaging and they get this glaze on their faces. And it's, as they get older and older, you know, sixth grade, there's even more glaze. By 10th grade, there's more glaze. By 12th grade, <laughs> there's so much glaze. And so we want to, whenever we see that happening, change things up. Do not feel bound to a lesson plan or a curriculum or something. You know, change it up, make it exciting. Because right now, as a home educator, you have the power to individualize their education. We don't have to go by somebody's plan that someone created who knows nothing about our child and doesn't know anything about my family or the strengths of my children or their personalities. But you do. And so you can change things up and just get rid of that glaze. Robert Frost said, I'm not a teacher. I'm an awakener. I love that. 
wake your children up. If they're falling asleep with what you're trying to teach them, stop it. We need to wake them up. Help them to find this love of learning because it's in there. You know, children, human beings love to learn. Learning is inside of them. Bring that out. Awaken that inside of them again. And so we can do that through um, many ways. And another way that we nurture this love of learning is by pointing out examples. So I love to read biographies with my children. I love to read historical fiction with my children um, about you know leaders of the world uh, from all different cultures and backgrounds and countries and how they have done great things. And so what I like to do is point out all of the things that they did in their lives. You know, I tell them, wow, do you know they must have worked so hard to do that? You know, think of how much work and how much they've studied and learned and sacrificed to become who they are today. And I do that whenever we see greatness somewhere. You know, if we're watching the Olympics, um, we talk about, wow, think of how much they learned and how much they've tried and worked hard at something. Or if we go to a show, like a ballet show, you know, we talk about how much work and how much learning these people have done. And because I want them to realize that to achieve greatness and they need to continue to work and to study and to try. And so this really helps to motivate them and increase this, you know, internal motivation in them because they want to be great. They want to do these great things. And so when you show them these examples and you explicitly help them to understand the study and the learning and the work that had to go into that, that's really going to help, you know, increase this natural desire for them to learn. Next is to be aware of the ad your personal attitudes of failure and mistakes. Because mistakes and failure are an absolutely an essential component to learning. When you are not going to learn if you don't make mistakes. And it's kind of like what we were talking about, Carol Dweck's research, right? Um, this, that I'm smart. And so this idea that smart people don't make mistakes is very, is completely incorrect. Um, because in order to learn, you have to make mistakes. I, it makes me think about Miss Frizzle in the Magic School Bus. She said, take chances, make mistakes, and get messy. You know, I love that. And that's what learning is about because, um, you know, if you're going to learn the piano, you're not just going to sit down and just play the piano perfectly. You're going to mess up a lot. And that is a really, really, really good thing because that means that you are learning. And so that's what I tell my children. And I try to make sure that they, I have that attitude about learning and to develop that kind of attitude um, and them, that mistakes and failure are a part of success, are a part of learning and growth, and that making mistakes is a really good thing because that means that they're learning. That means that they're trying. And so it gets rid of all these bad feelings about, oh, no, I made a mistake. I can't do this. This is too hard. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. It gets rid of all that and sees it as a really positive thing that, you know what, this mistake means I'm trying. I figured out one way that doesn't work, so now I'm going to work harder to figure out a way that does work. All right. Another step is to help them understand that they can make a difference right now. Um, it, it makes me think about this time when I was in college and I was given this assignment to write this really long paper and I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to write the paper, but it doesn't really matter because I'm, I'm going to read it and, you know, that's not going to change a whole lot. And the only other person who's going to read it is my professor. And he's going to read 25 other ones just like it and probably not pay a lot of attention to mine. And then that's it. And nothing's going to be done with all this work that I just did. 
because everything I do is just preparing me for adulthood, right? Um, and now, and that was really depressing for me. I mean, I did the paper, but you know, at the end of the day, it didn't really matter that much. You know, I did gain some valuable practice, and you know, in some ways, it did prepare me for adulthood. But what's happened in schooling is it's just become this like, you know, 21 plus years of preparation before you ever do anything meaningful. You know, I was feeling like I just wish someone would say, you know, we're going to write this paper and then we're going to do something with it. Because what you have created is important. Your voice can be heard and you can make changes in this world. And so, yes, education and youth is a preparation for adulthood, but our children are powerful and they can do really meaningful things now. They can make a difference right now. So if we can help them understand that them learning how to read can help them to make a really big difference right now, that's going to be really powerful. For instance, my husband was talking about starting a new business and from home and my daughter was like, oh, I want to help. And he's like, the biggest thing you can do to help is you can learn how to read. Because once you know how to read, you can help me so much with my business. Right? Another thing is just today, I was feeling a little frazzled earlier. I was trying to do different things at once. And my middle child came to me and she was whining and crying. And my daughter said, oh, I'll take her. Come on. Come on. I'm going to go read you a story. And it was so meaningful because she knew how to read. She was able to give this really meaningful act of service to her sister and to myself. And so children can do great things right now. You know, I heard a story about a young girl who created, decided she wanted to raise money for an orphanage on the other side of the world that she had actually visited. And she thought, I'm going to create this fair where we sell things and a portion is going to go through that. This girl was, you know, a young girl and she did that. She was making a difference right now. I recently read about another girl who learned how to sew and decided I'm going to learn how to sew and I'm going to send my dresses to help children living in young girls living in poverty in Africa. And she was making a difference as a child. They can make a difference. What they're learning can make a difference. It might be something like helping an orphanage around the world. It might be something as small as helping their brother or sister or their mom when they really need them. But help them to understand that them learning is powerful and that they can use what they learn right away. So, you know, really help them when they learn something new. Find a way to use that new knowledge in a really meaningful way. Because that's really going to get them excited about learning more when they can understand how important it is and how much of a difference they can make. And so those were our eight steps that we're talking about today. And I really feel that if we can develop children who grow up to be adults who love to learn and they know how to learn, that they can be unstoppable. Because truly, how can you stop a person who loves learning and they know how to learn? They can just do anything and they can go, go on to fulfill their own personal life mission. And that's what I want for my children. I want them to fulfill whatever mission that they feel God has placed in their heart for them to do in this lifetime. So I want to talk to you about how you can learn more. So if you enjoy this webinar, you can become involved in our education book club where um, we're going to read and study a lot of these books that have really helped me gain a lot of knowledge and that can help you gain a lot of knowledge about education and build your confidence and help you to learn you know, how to be a better home educator for your children. I have also created a course called Joyful and Natural Learning. And if you go to breathebelief.com, you will see a link that says my course. And there you can go there. It's absolutely free. I want to just share this knowledge with the world um, so that your children can have an education that's joyful and natural. So you can go there and learn a lot of free stuff there. I have a blog and podcast that's also completely free, breathebelief.com. 
And of course, join our Brief Belief community where we're going to do the things we talked about, you know, have these regular webinars. We're going to have that yearly retreat. We have, you know, our community um, where we share and inspire one another and really encourage each other. So thank you so much. Um, so now I want to just open up this chat feature right now. And so if you have any questions, you can um, shoot it over in the chat box. Let me just make sure that is up here. Do, do, do. All right, so I'll just take a minute. If you have a question, shoot in the chat box. Um, and if I don't see any, you know, thank you so much for coming. You can shoot me an email if you come up with a question later, and I'd be happy to answer it for you. If you have another topic you want to discuss in further webinars, let me know because, you know, I want to make this as um, beneficial for you as possible. So thank you so much for being a part of our community. Um, please share this webinar. What I've decided to do is to make this webinar open for other people so um, who are a part of our community to help bring more people in because I feel like the more people we can help and empower, the better. So feel free to share this webinar. Go back and watch it again, and I will see you guys next time. Thanks. Bye.